direct your attention to the baptistry. We have a couple baptisms for us this morning. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day in the neighborhood outside. We're glad that you're here to be a part of all that God's doing. The first thing we're going to do is let a couple of young adults give testimony of how God has changed their lives. We're going to do that through the act of baptism. First up this morning is Mr. Zeke Matson. This is Zeke. He gave his life to Christ, I believe, about a year ago. Not this VBS, but the VBS before that. Uh, he's got Christ in his heart, and today he comes to share that testimony uh, through the act of baptism. As he goes under, he's signifying Jesus' death, then his burial, and his resurrection. So he comes up, he's saying that that Jesus is the Lord of his life. Is that your testimony, Zeke, that Jesus is boss? That was what we agreed on, a big head nod, so good. Zeke, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're going to do it, do it with flair. Next up is the lovely Miss Tristan Griner. Tristan? Tristan gave her life to Christ a couple years back. Same thing. She's got Christ as her Savior has had. She's come today. She came forward a week or so ago and said, I want to make that public. I want to let folks know. So she's doing that today. Same symbol, same testimony uh, that Jesus is the Lord of her life. And she's not ashamed to say that. Is that your testimony, Tristan? Yes. Then I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In case you didn't know, that was worship. We're going to continue worship now. Brother Brett, if you'll come and lead us in prayer and whatever else you got on the plate there. So. Good morning, everyone. Isn't that an amazing way to start off our service today? You can give them one more round of applause for what God's doing. All right, I have a couple of announcements for us this morning. But before I get into that, I want to say, first off, we are glad that you are here this morning. And if you're new here, we are really glad that you're here this morning. If you're new, we have um, new... Connection, I forgot. Yeah, it's the morning. Um, so there are connection, I can't even think. Cards, yeah, there are connection cards in the seats in front of you. Uh, you can all, there's also a way to fill that out online. This gets us more information about you so that we can send you more information about our church and how you can get involved here. Um, so I'm going to try to get through announcements. We'll see if my brain's working this morning. Um, first announcement, uh, the WMU Bake Seal starts today in the Fellowship Hall. Um, it'll be going on in the next couple of weeks. So make sure if you are wanting some goodies, you go down and get some from the bake sale down there in the Fellowship Hall. Next announcement, we have a fall youth retreat coming up at the end of October, October 27th through the 29th. It's going to be here at our church, and we're inviting two other churches to partner with us on this. And so um, if you have youth students, 6th through 12th grade, Everyone is welcome to come to this through 6th through 12th grade. Make sure you get them signed up um, and make sure they invite their friends. This event is only going to be $25, keeping the cost low so that more students can come and have fun, but also have time to learn more about Jesus and grow in their faith. And so 
make sure you sign up for that. We also will need help for that. You can sign up and volunteer and find out more information in the fellowship hall. There's a sign up for that. But some of the main things that we'll need, I know we need three more host homes, so homes that will house some of our students um, on Friday and Saturday night for, for the retreat. And so we desperately need some more host homes as well as possibly some more people to help out with small groups or food. So be praying about that, how you can help out in that regard. And all, as always, you can always financially support. We have some students that, um, some students will come to us and say, hey, I wanna go to the retreat, but I can't afford it. So you can always give to the retreat because of that. But as well as this retreat, it is only, it's gonna be less money than normal. So it's only $25. And so we're going into it at a loss so that more students can go. And so you can always give generally to the youth retreat as well. Lastly, we have a trunk or treat October 31st. And I know we need volunteers for this to help out with this, as well as candy donations. Make sure you look in your bulletin, see the information about that, talk to Katie, um, as well as make sure that you look at your bulletin for all the other things going on in our church. There's always a lot more stuff going on, a lot more stuff that we could announce. Make sure you check that. Um, go ahead and pray with me as we begin our service this morning. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for what you are doing here in your church today. Lord, I pray that you would just remind us of who you are. Lord, I pray that you would just help us understand your word. I pray that you would just help us clear our hearts as we come and worship you, Lord. Lord, remind us that this is your church. Help us submit once again to you, Lord. Lord, thank you for this time. Please just help us hear your word, apply it to our lives. We just thank you for this time. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, come on down and join me in the front for Children's Spotlight. Okay, so I have some leaves this morning, and I'll let you touch them, but I need you to touch them gently because I need to use them for a second service, so it's not going to do us any good if you crumble them. <laughs> so here, you want to pass them around and look at them? There you are. You can look at them. Yes, that one. You can kind of switch them around. Look at them. There's one more. All right. All right. What do we notice about them? Here. Look at that one. Here, pass them back and let Eli look at these. Thank you. What do we notice about them? They're wet because they came out of my front yard this morning. You're right. Yes, yes. What else? Are they all the same? No, they're all different, right? They're all different colors. They're all different shapes. Even though they came from the same tree, they came from the tree in my front yard, right? They're all different colors. They're different shapes. They're all kind of different light, like cycles of their, or stages of their life cycle, right? Because they're all like the green one, obviously, I picked straight from the tree, but then the other ones came from my grass, and they had been in my grass for various amounts of time because some of them are more brown and some of them are kind of yellow because they just fell off. So um, they're all unique, and that's exactly the way that we are as well. Um, we're all unique, but these, these leaves, they all serve a, the same purpose, right? Even though they look different, they are different colors, they're different stages, they all serve the purpose of nourishing the tree. Now, when they've fallen off the tree, obviously they aren't doing a very good per job of their purpose of nourishing the tree, but they all d serve the same purpose of nourishing the tree um, when they're attached to the tree. And we're kind of like this because each of us are unique and yet we all serve the same purpose of glorifying God and obeying him and, um, and uh, bringing people to his kingdom, telling people about Jesus. So we all serve that same purpose um, just like the leaves serve the same purpose of nourishing the tree, we serve the same purpose of glorifying God. And Jesus actually uses a very similar analogy by saying that we are kind of like branches and he's like the vine. So again, the branches are attached to the vine. And so it says in John 15, four through five, remain in me as I, as I remain also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so um, being bearing much fruit in this instance would be just like what we just talked about, glorifying God 
and telling others about his kingdom and being Christ-like and all those kind of things, that's, that's what bearing fruit means in that instance. And so if we are attached to Christ, if we are connected with Christ, then we are going to be bearing much fruit. We're going to be serving our purpose, just like these leaves serve their pur- purposes. They were attached to the tree. Um, and so what are ways that we can stay connected with God? What? You know the answers to this. What are ways that we stay connected with God? Go for it, Ben. We can pray, yeah. Yeah, we can tell other people about him. We can pray. Yeah, Eli. We can tell the truth. Uh-huh. We can tell the truth because we're obeying him when we do that, right? We can read the Bible. There's the other big answer I was looking for. Yeah, because when we are connected with him, we're praying and we're reading the Bible because we're talking to him and we're reading his word. So we're reading what he said to us. And so those are both big ways. But then also there are other ways of like telling people about Christ and telling the truth. And all those things are ways that we're obeying Christ. And so those are other ways that we can connect with him because we're obeying him. And so um, this morning, that's what I have to remind you of, that to stay connected with Christ, it's super important because... uh, Otherwise, you're not serving your purpose as Christians. Your purpose as Christians is to glorify God and to bring glory to him by telling the truth and by telling others about Jesus and all the other ways that you can obey him um, as listed and described in the Bible. I'm not going to describe everything to you, but you know the general concepts. And so that's what I have for you this morning. Stay connected with Christ because it's the most important thing. And I think this is a super fun season as we look around. We can learn so much from the trees as they change colors and all that kind of thing. Um, It's a good reminder to stay connected with Christ because we also need to stay, um, as the leaves, stay connected with God. So that's what I have for us this morning. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray then. God, this morning I just thank you for everything that you've given us. And I thank you for these kids that you've brought here this morning, that each one of them heard your word this morning. And I pray for Brett as he comes to share the word that we will hear you through him, God, and I just thank you for um, the beautiful testimony of baptism this morning that you've given us that chance to um, see the testimony of uh, Tristan and Zeke both, that they came before us and showed how how much they love you and how they're willing to follow you in obedience, and I just thank you for that, God, and I um, thank you for this chance to worship you and honor you this morning to stay connected with you. In your name I pray, amen. Good morning, church family. We're so glad that you're here to worship our Heavenly Father today. Let's stand as we join our voices together and lift his praise to the heavens. Yeah. 
is faithful and the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? Amen. No. Oh. 
praises. Lord, to worship you through the study of your word. Lord, to hear a message from the Holy Spirit. Lord, we've gathered in your name because your name is holy and it is the highest name. And there's no other name above it or beside it. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. Lord, you are worthy of the breath in our lungs and the time of day that you have given us, Lord, for we have nothing that you have not given. Lord, I just pray that you continue to soften and mold my heart. Lord, release my fingers and my grasp on the things that I hold tightly to, Lord, because they're truly not mine. They're yours. Lord, help me to live in a way that I'm ready to give back whatever you would ask of me. Lord, because you are so worthy. And in the times that I don't remember that, Lord, I just ask that you would have Holy Spirit give me a gentle nudge or if I needed a whack on the head. Lord, because you know each one of us and how to speak to us best. Lord, and any here who, you, who do not know you, Lord, I just pray that Lord, you would speak a message and a word to their heart today, Lord, that they would hear your knock and they would answer. Lord, because knowing you is the greatest treasure. Lord, because you fight our battles. Lord, you love us unrelentlessly, unchanging. Lord, your grace and your mercies are made new every morning. Lord, we love you, not just for the things that you do, but for who you are. Lord, you are the God that doesn't change. You are Jehovah. Lord, you are so worthy of our praise. And thank you for continuing to reveal yourself to us, to show yourself, to show us how you're working. And thank you for allowing us to be part of that. We thank you for this time of worship this morning, Lord. And we know we're not done, Lord, because worship is a state of living. Lord, but we thank you for this time together this morning. It's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church family. Do you enjoy worship so far? It's good stuff, Maynard. If you want to go ahead and turn your Bibles, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse, we'll start reading in verse 19 this morning and look at most of the chapter around that. While you're doing that, just a reminder, this is our come and see Sunday School High Attendance Sunday this morning. So you came to see, and we'll find out what God's going to do today in worshiping in Sunday School uh, that was the invitation or the theme was come and see what God is doing, what he can do as we gather together as the body of Christ. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, in the sermon today, but also what he can do in our life. What, what can God do in our life? And it, uh, I had a little tug of war with the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Usually I don't like to bring up heavy things before the sermon and in the middle of worship, but there's some stuff going on in our world that we need to see what God can do about as well. So... Uh, if you've not been paying attention to the news, and I try not to, but sometimes it kicks in the door and gets your attention anyway. <clears throat> Some terrorists have uh, gone into Israel and killed a whole bunch of folks and wreaking havoc, and Israel's declared war, and it's a mess over there. And uh, we are called to pray for all people at all places, and especially when it deals with uh, the nation of Israel, who are God's people. <clears throat> Whatever his plan for Israel is, he will make it happen, but... Uh, this will be a good time, I think, for us as the body of Christ to pray for them. So I was going to try to do that at the end because that's usually where I do it. And I say, you know, we'll just do it while we've got our focus here. Before I put you to sleep with the sermon, you'll get, we'll get the praying done. So if you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes and just in your own way, lift up this situation in Israel. Pray for the leaders. Pray for God's Holy Spirit to move in a marvelous way and bring peace as only he can. Pray for safety for those who are in harm's way. Pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones. Just pray for that situation as God leads you. Then I'll close this in just a second.
Father, I have no idea exactly what's going on in that part of the world. I don't know what your plan for all of that is in this moment in time. In the long run, yes, but in this moment in time. So we turn all that over to you. We pray for your power to fall, that we would watch and see what only you can do, that, God, you would bring hope and peace through all this, that you bring your kingdom's purposes about through all of this, that, Father, this will be a wake-up call for all of us, that there is evil in the world, and we as the body of Christ need to share the gospel everywhere throughout the world so that these hearts and these lives can be changed as well. So we just ask you to move as only you can, and you bring about hope and healing in the midst of the chaos and craziness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that and letting us listen to God's leadership this morning. Let's go ahead, if you would, and stand. I'm going to read Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 31, and we'll talk about some other verses that we don't actually read. So this is what God's Word has to say. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Help it to come to light in our lives that, God, we would understand what you're trying to say to us in this part of Hebrews. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Before you shut your Bibles or your Bible app in your phone, what is the first word in our text today? Hebrews 19, very first word. Therefore is the correct answer. Everybody who said that gets a piece of bubble gum. You'll have to go buy it on your own, but you get a piece of bubble gum. That's what you get. Do you remember the old Bible study trick? Anytime you see the word therefore in Scripture, you need to look back and see what it's therefore. Why is that therefore there? That was almost a full sentence, wasn't it? Why is that therefore there? In this case, it's referring back to all of our lessons so far through Hebrews that God is speaking to us through His Son, that Jesus is superior in all those ways that we've looked at. Very specifically, it's looking back to chapters 8, 9, and the very first 18 verses of chapter 10 that we didn't read, where it talks about Jesus is a superior high priest, and that He ushers in a new covenant that we looked at two weeks ago, or several weeks ago, uh, in Hebrews 8. He ushers in a new covenant, a new way of relating to God, and He does that through a superior sacrifice that Better Brett talked about last week in Hebrews 9, which was his own body and his own blood. That therefore is there to transition us from all of those truths, all of what we study through Hebrews 1 through 7, all of what we study in Hebrews 8, 9, and the first part of 10, all of that truth. Therefore, this is what we're supposed to do. This is the application phase of Hebrews. We've had a lot of Old Testament Remember we talked about 80 plus Old Testament references when we did the intro. The, the, they keep going back to the Old Testament. We looked at the Old Covenant, the Old Tabernacle, the Old Way of Sacrificing. This, this is the transition to the new way. And what are we supposed to do with all of this information? So it, it gives us some things, the applications for that. And it, the writer of Hebrews calls us to do four things in this short little passage that we read. First is to draw near. Secondly is to hold on. Third is to encourage others. And fourthly, to persevere. 
So let's take a look at what the writer or the preacher of the book of Hebrews <clears throat> was saying to us as the Holy Spirit inspired him to preach this and then ultimately to write it down for us. The first thing, the first thing, the first application, the first thing we're supposed to do with all of this truth that we've been given, that Jesus is superior, he brings in a superior covenant, a superior uh, sacrifice, a superior way of relating. Well, the first thing we're supposed to do once we know that is we need to draw near in verses 19 through 22. Verses 19 through 21 are a, transa- a transition from the old truths to the application. Verse 19, it talks about we have, since we have confidence to enter the inner sanctuary, that holy, holy, holy place uh, that Brett talked about last week. Since we have confidence that we can enter that, and that, that is God's presence, we have confidence that we can come into God's presence, and we have confidence that we can do that through Jesus' sacrifice, that new and living way. It's all in verse 19 and tw- through 21. And since we can come via our new high priest, that we talked about the Jesus, the once for all, forever high priest that doesn't need to be replaced, doesn't ever wear out, he's the energizer bunny. Since all of these things are true, since all of these things are truth, then here's what we need to do. We need to draw near to God. That's all available for us. All of that, this new way, the new covenant that's been paved, the doors are open, we can come in the Holy Ghost. If it's open, then draw near. Take advantage of that in verse 22. It's our first application of all of that that we've learned. And it comes with some instructions of how to draw near. Don't you love instructions? Remember when instructions used to have like words with them before it was just pictures on a piece of paper? All of you that are my age and older, I don't speak I can ease. I need, I need words. I need words. Insert this here and take this out here. I, this picture with diagrams is not working for But we get some words here, some instructions on how to draw near. It comes with instructions or descriptors of how to do so. And there are four of them. And they'll show up on your screen magically and in your bulletin in the outline there. The first is we need to draw near with a sincere heart. With a sincere heart. God is all about the heart when he relates to us. It's all about relationship. It's all about intimacy. It talks, we learn about, we ask Jesus to come into our hearts. We write, God has decided to write his laws upon our heart. He says that we are to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. God is all about the heart. It's all about relationship. It's all about him wanting to have an intimate relationship with us and us to have an intimate relationship with him. Holding nothing back, fully surrendering to him. A sincere heart is how we draw near. We come open. We come ready. We come with our hearts wide open to be in relationship with him. Draw near with a sincere with a sincere heart. Secondly, with full assurance of our faith. It's talking about putting our trust in Christ and Christ alone. That we need to come fully trusting Christ, a full assurance of our faith. Don't come in and go, I got a little bit of faith. I'm not sure if it's going to be. Boom, here I am. I got faith. I can come into the presence of God because of all of those promises. Here I am in his presence, full of faith because I have Christ as my Savior, that rest that we talked about. I can relax in that relationship. We don't want to trust or just have a little bit of Jesus in our life. We talked a long time ago in a sermon far, far away uh, about getting an inoculation of Jesus. We get just enough Jesus to keep us from getting the real thing. That's not how we're supposed to come. We're not supposed to come having Jesus plus something. Well, I, got, I got Jesus, but I got this too. I'm trusting in it. It's Jesus alone. Come with full assurance of our faith. Our faith is enough to come to draw near before God. The third thing is that we need to come with our hearts sprinkled. What? Why do we need our hearts sprinkled? It says in verse 22 that we do that because it cleanses us from a guilty conscience. It points back to that old system. Remember in the old system, the tabernacle, when they came in, they sprinkled everything with blood to cleanse it. Now, I'm not sure how throwing blood on something cleanses it, but it did, okay? That was what was prescribed by the law. So when they came into the... They, everything in the tabernacle, they sprinkled blood on and it made it holy because without the shedding of blood, there is no sac- there is no forgiveness of sin. So they had that blood. But they said, and Brett preached about this last week, that that blood didn't cleanse you from a guilty conscience. That putting it on the 
articles in the tabernacle didn't do anything for you, but Hebrews 9.14 says this, as soon as I find it. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness, consciousness from the acts that lead to death so that we may serve a living God? The blood of Jesus does. We come sprinkled with our hearts, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus because that gives us a clean conscience. I was messing around with Bob Tipton out in the lobby today and he asked me how I am. I said, I'm perfect. So now if you say me not so, but when God looks down, I'm perfect because the shed blood of Jesus Christ covers me and all he sees is paid in full, paid in full, paid in full. That's what it means to have our heart, to be sprinkled with the blood, to be, have our hearts sprinkled, to come that way before the Lord. And that, and that then, according to Hebrews 9, 14, allows us to serve a living God. Allows us to serve a living God. The fourth thing is, it says we need to come, we need to draw near having our bodies washed with pure water. I'm pretty sure that's not talking about taking a shower. I'm not a scholar, but I'm pretty sure that's not it. Some would say that means baptism, that we saw a couple of young adults experience today, and that may well be, but for sure, what it for sure means is it, it's talking about a lifestyle of righteousness, that what we profess with our mouths, we actually live out with our lives. That our bodies are used and are seen as a temple of God used for His services. That we don't say one thing and say we believe one thing and our lives do something completely opposite of that. We need to be washed, have bodies that are washed by the pure water. That we need to allow God to come into us so much so that how we act, what we say, what we dwell on, how our activities are, our, the words that come out of our mouth, how we treat each other, all of those things point to Him and not to all those flaws that are on the side of us, that we need to come before him holy. We need to draw, before, draw near to him, understanding that he owns all of us. He owns all of us, including our bodies, including our lifestyle, including what we do. In these ways, these are the ways we're to draw near to God, to let him fully dwell in us and with us, because Jesus paid the price. He made the way. He is the way, the living way. He did everything necessary for us to draw near to God in intimacy. So draw near is the first application. The second application is hold on. Hold on. That's what we say sometimes when I back out of the driveway and put it in drive. Yeah. Hold on. Here we go. Hold on. It's, we're called to hold on in verse 23. We're called to hold on to the hope we have. Anybody want to guess who our hope is? If you don't say Jesus, you're not trying. Say it with me. Jesus. Jesus is our hope. The gospel message is our hope. That God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us that we, if we believe in him, put our lives in him, we don't have to perish. We can have eternal, abundant, everlasting life. That is our hope. We have no other hope. That is the one and only hope that we have. And we can trust in this hope because verse 23 says, he who promised it is faithful. God's not going to go back on his promise to us that if we give our lives to him, we have eternal life. It's a done deal. So we can hold on. Excuse me. We can hold on to that hope. Note the adverb. I'm pretty sure it's an adverb. An English teacher can check me later. Note the adverb describing what we're supposed, how we're supposed to hold on to our hope. Unswervingly. That's just an underused word, isn't it? Unswervingly. I'm going to use that all week long. I'm not sure how, but I'm going to use it because I like that word. Unswervingly. Don't hold on and then let go. And then hold on and then let go. You know what happens if you have a hold of the steering wheel in your car and you let go? Depending on your alignment, you're going to swerve. Okay? If you let go, it's going to... And if you, don't, if you let go too long, you'll end up in the ditch. Okay? Hold on. Unswervingly. Going in a straight line, hold on to the hope that we have. Remember several chapters back in Hebrews, we talked about our hope <clears throat> being our soul anchor. That when we have that hope in Jesus, it anchors our soul so we don't drift off into all the other garbage in the world. It says that he is our soul anchor. What this is saying is hold on. Hold on to that rope. Hold on to the rope that's tied to the anchor, which is Jesus. Don't let go. That is our hope. Hold on unswervingly, never letting go, never looking somewhere else for hope, hold on 
to our hope. The third application is encourage others or encourage one another. Verses 24 and 25. I'm going to read 24 again. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Sometimes we want to spur each other. That rascally so and so. It says we're supposed to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Oh, that kind of spurring. Oops, my bad. That's what we're called to do, is to spur one another on to love and good deeds. It says, it's a, it is a reminder that the faith journey that we're on is not a solo activity, as so many people try to make it. Our faith journey is not about just us and our relationship. It's about others, all those around us. Almost every Sunday we talk about we are family. This is what this is talking about. We are family. We're to encourage each other, to love each other, to encourage one another, to look around and say, how is he doing or how is she doing? How can I encourage them to live all that God has for them? How can I pray for them? How can I, if I need to give them a word of, uh, are you sure about that? Yeah, do it in love, but do it, you know. Look around and be a part of what God has for us. How can we help a brother or sister? How can we experience, encourage them to experience all that God has? How can we love them and serve them and help them love and serve others? One of the ways to do this is found in verse 25. Verse 25 says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Do you find it odd that Hebrews 10.25 fell on Come and See Sunday, on High Attendance Sunday? Better Brett pointed this out to me this week. He said, that's quite a coincidence, isn't it? He said, isn't, isn't what you're preaching on this Sunday going to be 10.25? I said, yeah. And he said, that's Come and See Sunday. I said, ooh. Now, I promise you, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. But God is. I'm just saying. There is a reason that's in the scripture. Meeting together is not optional. It is not optional. I mean, it's optional from the standpoint if you don't want to follow what God's word says, yes, it's optional. But we can't, again, we're not solo Christians. We're not in this just for us. We're to meet together because meeting together is essential. It's essential for our life. It's essential for the gospel. It's essential for the body of Christ. It's essential for all of those things. It just is. And gathering together in and of itself is an encouragement. Or it ought to be. If we get together and it doesn't encourage us, we're doing something wrong. Either as the body of Christ or as us as individuals, if we come and it's not an encouragement, something is wrong because this is our family. This is our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's supposed to encourage us to live for Christ. It's supposed, we're supposed to be about building each other up. If we're here and we're tearing each other down, we're doing it backwards. The world will tear us down. There's plenty of folks who will tear us down. This is where we come to be built up in Christ. We need to meet together. And it says, all the more as the day draws near. The day. Huh. The day. Folks, Jesus is coming back. Can you see the signs? Not. Just open up your eyes for a moment. They're everywhere. Now, it may not be this week may not be in my lifetime, but Jesus is coming back. And this call is, we need to get to work as the body of Christ. This lollygagging around, enjoying our little fellowship and letting the world go to Hades in a handbasket is not what God's plan is. We need to get to work. We need to encourage one another to get at the task, to live for God because our consciousness has been cleansed. We can live for God. Let's live for God and bring the world to his doorstep. Bring his kingdom into lives all around us because it desperately, desperately needs it. We need to encourage others. The last application is in verses 26 through 39. And verse 26 begins a very different tone in the applications. These other are kind of warm and fuzzy and, you know, hang on and, you know, uh, draw near to God and hang on to your hope and encourage each other. And this last one is talking about persevering. And it says, 
it starts talking about, it's another warning about don't fall away. We had one in Hebrews 6 that we wallowed in for a little while, a few weeks back. It's the same warning in a different place in Hebrews, but it's the same warning. It says don't fall away. And that's one of the sub-themes all throughout Hebrews. And it says in verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received all of these truths, what we look back to, the therefore stuff, if we deliberately keep on sinning after all of that, there's no sacrifice left to help you. And that's the same question that we had in Hebrews 6. Does it, what does that mean? Is that Christians who get lost? Is that folks who never were Christians? Is the ones that we gave did something but it wasn't faith that saves like in James? The same answers apply. You know, that, that's the same question, the same answers. The message is, though, don't be one of these. Don't be that person. Don't be the person who deliberately keeps on sinning. Don't be the one who does that. What you're saying, what the, what the writer is saying in that process is, that it's a bad idea to do that. Trying to do it your own way is a bad idea. To create your own gospel is a bad idea. Because that's what you're saying. If you keep on sinning but think that's going to be okay, you're rewriting the gospel. You're writing your own gospel. You're trying to make it where I can do this and this and this because those pages don't really matter when it says don't do this. When it says gather together, that doesn't matter. Okay, I'm going to create my own gospel. That's not how God works. We had talked last week about you got to come to God under His terms. And verse 31 is a scary, scary, scary verse which is the outcome of when we try to come to God in our terms and not His. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We don't want to come to God on our own terms. We want to come to God under the terms of the new covenant, of the one who is our once-for-all sacrifice and our once-for-all high priest. That's how we come boldly into the presence of God. Marching into God's presence on our own terms is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And then the rest, I'll gallop kind of quickly through the rest that we didn't read of uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, he's, the writer's saying, don't be that person because that's not who you are. I know you, that's not who you are. Then he reminds his readers in verses 32 through 34 of the earlier days. Remember back when you were living out your faith and you were encouraging others and all these things. He says, remember, just read through that as, as I'm talking. That's what he's saying in verses 32 through 34. Remember back to those times Verse 35 says, don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away that confidence we talked about in verse 22, that full faith, assurance of our full faith. Don't throw that away and try to do it on your own. Keep coming to God in the faith that you have in Him. Verse 36 says that the point, the fourth application says we need to persevere. We need to keep hanging on to Jesus. We need to keep drawing near to God. We need to keep encouraging others as the day draws near. All those applications he's already given says keep doing those. Don't grow weary of doing good. Keep doing what God has called us to do. Keep making these applications over and over and every day for the rest of our lives. Keep doing it. And then verse 38 says we're to do all this or live all this out by faith. By faith. So what's it mean to live it out by faith? You'll have to come next week in Hebrews 11. To get that answer. Because that's all that talks about in Hebrews 11. Is how do we do these things by faith. Then verse 39 in closing. Is a great closing verse for this chapter. It says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. But of those who believe and are saved. We, family, are not of those who shrink back. Who don't persevere and are destroyed, but we are those who believe, keep on believing, keep on hanging on, and we're saved, and we reap our full reward. Let's be those people in our lost world. Bow your heads and close your eyes. As we come to our time of invitation, our praise team will come up and guide us in that process as musically. So here's where we are. God has called us. He's given us very, very, very specific directions. Draw near. Draw near to God. The way is paved. Draw near to God. If you're here today and you've never taken advantage of that salvation offer, today is a perfect day to do that.
And we start singing in just a minute. You come and ask them, hey, how can I know that I have eternal life? How can I have Christ as my Savior? That's how you draw near. Believers, we're called to draw near as well. We're called not to drift away, but to draw near to God. To come with sincere hearts, open to Him. To come washed by the blood of Christ. That's all of us. None of us is so close to God that we cannot draw near. And then hold on. Hold on. Unswervingly to our hope. And then encourage others in the body of Christ to do so. Ask God, God, how am I doing? How am I doing? And drawing near. God, how am I doing at holding on to my hope? How am I doing at encouraging others and making it not just about me, but about the kingdom's work? Whatever God speaks to you in that, you and God work that out. He's calling you. He's calling you to draw near. You may be here today and you have something that you just need someone to pray for you about. And we have some family, church family members that have some prayer needs and we'll take care of those here in just a minute. If you have a need, you come. Let us pray with you. And if you need to plant your life in this church, this is where God wants you to be. The way to do that is to come forward in this service and just say, hey, I want my life and my family's life to be a part of this church. We'll help you figure out how to do that. But you come here in just a second. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. God's Holy Spirit is going to continue to speak, and we're going to do what He asks us to do. Father God, we love You. Not as much as we should, but we love You. <clears throat> so God, in these moments, draw us close to You. Help us to give our hearts completely to You. Father, those who have never done that today would. Those who have known you for years but are holding back, that we would. That, Father, you would bring those that need for prayer, that need to join. God, that these moments, these next moments will be yours. And we'll just do what you ask us to do. Thank you for your presence in this place. And that we can come boldly before your throne room because of the shed blood of Christ. We ask it all in his name. Amen.